Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In this episode, we're going to be looking at the story of Howard Snyder, a B-17 Flying Fortress pilot flying with the US 8th Air Force from Britain. Through letters Howard wrote to his wife and exhaustive research, his son Steve has pieced together the remarkable story of his father and what happened after his plane was brought down in Belgium. The book is shot down. But before we get to Steve, I'd like to take a moment to thank all those new patrons of the show who came aboard in the last month or so. Keep your eyes peeled, as I do have a little extra for you. For those of you who are not already patrons, I could use your help. A dollar or so from each one of you helps me to find the time to put the show together. So for more information how to become a patron, head over to patreon.com slash ww2podcast or if patron is not your thing and you prefer PayPal, go to ww2podcast.com forward slash support. Steve, thanks for joining me. Let's start by looking um at your father pre-war what was your father doing in um in 1939 when the uh, when the war broke out oh in 39 he was uh 20 24 he went to high school but he didn't go on to college you know not that many people went to college back then actually uh he was working for a clothing store desmond's clothing in los angeles there was a chain they had i forget now off the top of my head but they had quite a few stores in southern california and so he was a assistant uh, warehouse manager there. So he was into clothes. He was kind of a dapper, dapper guy. So that's what he was doing when when the war broke out. Did he know what was coming? I mean, he he, um, he volunteers for the army. Um, why did he volunteer for the army? Well, that, that was really a result of the first peacetime draft in U.S. history implemented by President Franklin Roosevelt in the fall of 1940. So. All the men, you know, in, in his uh, age, I think it was 25 to 35 initially, uh, had to register for the draft. And so he registered. And then in uh, April of 1942, he actually uh, went into the army. Into the army. But, but he ends up in the Air Force. So how does he get from the army to the Air Force? <laughs> well, he uh, went into the army in April of 41. And then uh, he married my mother, Ruth Hempel, in July of 1941. You know, the war broke out. Uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed by uh, Japan on December 7th of 41. And things were in a great upheaval at that time. My mother was very concerned about uh, the future that was very uncertain. So she went up to Washington, the state of Washington, where my dad was uh, stationed over Christmas that year. And she got pregnant. And so my dad was worried, like, well, how, how am I going to support this, my new family? I got a, a new bride, baby on the way, and he didn't think he could do it very well on a private's pay in the Army. So he decided to volunteer for the Air Force where he could make more money, especially if he could make it through pilot training, become an officer. He would be able to make more money and then better provide for his family. So that's why he went into the air force it's one of those wonderful practical things that uh, r- rather than any sort of flag waving anything else it's kind of it, he needed money his wife's pregnant it's all about the money <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> and how did he how did he manage with flight training because you know the, the planes were still relatively new they must have been like uh, you know uh, <laughs> this is like all oh, like astronauts now you know this is a really new technology it was you know Real cutting edge stuff. How did he get on with flight training? Yeah, absolutely. Back then, you know, there weren't that many people that flew airplanes. They were mostly all biplanes. In fact, in primary training, uh, the first stage of pilot training, he flew a Sturman, uh, you know, biplane. And then that's where he soloed uh, for the first time. But it was pretty exciting, pretty exciting stuff uh, back then. Uh, flying in airplanes. Do you have the letters going back that far? Was did he find it all uh, rigorous the the flight training? And did he? Did, I mean, you can't have struggled that which that much with it. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been a pilot. Right. Well, it was uh, going through pilot training was very difficult because forty percent of the men who uh, went into pilot training got washed out 
because it was very hard. Uh, not only was, you know, you had to learn how to fly, but you had to learn mathematics and physics and uh, a lot of different uh, mental disciplines uh, t- to be a pilot. His big problem during p- uh, pilot training was that he missed his wife because they had just gotten married. And, you know, then he, he had to be he had to be separated. So he missed her a great deal. And he expressed that in the letters that he uh, wrote to my mother while he was during, in pilot training. But that once he got through the three stages, they were primary, basic and advanced training. And then he graduated from advanced pilot training in April of 1943. Then uh, the other training, as far as transitional training, where he learned how to fly a B-17 four engine bomber. And then on to operational crew training, where the various members of the crew came together and they learned to operate as a team. Uh, the officers could have their wives with them. So at least during those phases, you know, uh, they were actually both in Texas. Uh, my mother moved down there and uh, they could spend you know time together. So they were reunited there. But uh, he, he enjoyed uh, the pilot training, you know, much more when he was reunited with his with his wife and also his little infant girl at this time. This is a question that just came to me when I was reading the book. So I don't know if you're wearing a you in the RAF. What the, the 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 way they took put crews together was to sort of push them all into a hangar, all the men, and just say, "Okay, make crews." And these guys who often never met before would have to go around and introduce themselves to one another and say, well, we're looking for, I'm looking for a gunner and I'm a pilot. And eventually the, you know, they'd have the crews. How, how was his crew put together? I mean, did they, 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 they just sort of issued crew, you know, here's your crew or do you have any, any, do you know how they came up with the crews? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the air force that they, they just assigned guys. Uh, I don't know, you know, how they did that actually. But, you know, there was a and I have you know, still a copy of this of a, an order issued that uh, this is, you know, Howard Snyder's the pilot. And then these are going to be the men on his crew. And you're ordered to report to uh, Pyote Army Air, Airfield in, in Texas to begin, you know, operational crew training. So they were just assigned, you know, I, randomly. I, I really don't know how they did that. Another thing that was interesting, though, was the, the guys that went through pilot school. You know, they assigned one to be the lead pilot and one to be the co-pilot. I think a lot of that was kind of random, although my dad, I think several reasons why my dad became a lead pilot or the first pilot is that he was uh, a lot older than most of the other guys. Well, at that time, he was 27 when he, when he was uh, became a lead pilot. Plus, he was married and he had a family, so he was responsible. He had been a manager at a department store, so he so he had some leadership ability. He was he was the captain on his high school basketball team. So I think a lot of factors led that. Well, you know, he might be a a good you know a, a leader. That's just my feeling, though. I don't know if that was if that was true. I'm sure it is because you know at twenty compared to probably compared to the rest of the young I say young kids you know twenty seven they all look good to me but uh, <laughs> But uh, he would, to the 18 year olds, he would seem like the old man <laughs> at 27. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially being married and working, you know, because a lot of them, some of his members, especially the gunners, you know, they were 18 years old. They were just out of high school. Yeah. <laughs> and especially married with children. So again, add, add sort of a gravitas of age to them. You got kids? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to find a girl on my first date. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now, they're, put, they're posted, they are posted to uh, Britain. Um, how did your father feel about leaving his uh, wife and, and uh, baby daughter? Because, th- you know, th- there's no way they will be following him. And there's probably no way he would want them to follow him to war-torn Britain. He and his crew uh, reported to the 306 bomb group in Thurlai, England. On October 21st of 1943, he said that that was pretty an exciting time. I mean, all, all the country was behind the war effort at that time, and it was it was exciting from the standpoint that these a lot of these guys, you know, they hadn't traveled at all during their lives. Back then, you know, you didn't get on a, a plane. You know, there was no commercial travel. It was very provincial. The, most of the United States was very rural at that time. 
you know, people lived uh, in the country. They didn't live in big cities. They only associated with people like themselves in a little whole town. You know, guys had never been out of their 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 county, let alone all of a sudden they find themselves halfway around the world in England fighting a war. So it, it was very, very ex- ex- exciting for him at that time. Yeah, I, I, I got the feeling he was, he found it quite thrilling. Do you think there was surprise at what they found in Britain? Yeah, I think it was a big shock for all the GIs. You know, it was a shock for the Brits having all these Americans come over. And there was a shock for the Americans because you know, everything was so co- comparatively so old. 500 year old buildings were new in Britain. <laughs> the United States, you know, it's just so young. And even though, you know, if both the, the Brits and uh, the Americans speak English, it was a different type of English. The weather was a lot different. The people were different. The customs were different. It was a shock. It was a uh, big learning experience. I thought the rem- his reminiscences about his trips to London were, were really interesting. I mean, what if you could tell us about those? Most of those came from letters that he had written to my mother while he was stationed uh, in England. And unlike, unlike most guys that wrote back home, my dad was very candid in what he wrote in those letters to my mother. He wrote about you know, what life was like on the base, what life was like in England and London at the time, what bombing missions were like, escapades, as you referred to, of members in his crew. And so that that was fascinating. That's one of the things that really got me, you know, my passion, you know, running high to learn more about my dad and his crew because of these stories he told about going into England, uh, trying to shop for things to send home to my mother, um, which was, you know, with rationing going on in Britain at the time, it was tough to find stuff and it was expensive. Uh, the blackouts, you know, trying to just get around London. You, you know, they said, the, he said, you know, they, you get lost all the time because you couldn't see where you were going. It was so dark going into the pubs or the, the speakeasies and drinking and, you know, having a jolly old time. And uh, these guys were young, the first time away from home. The first, they could do anything they wanted to, really. They didn't have peers or their, their church or their family. You know, they could start drinking. You know, they, a lot of these guys had never drank before, never spoke before, uh, didn't have sex before. And all of a sudden, they could get all that in, in, in London when they went into town. So it was, it, it was quite an experience for those guys. They came across, very, it seemed to come across very much as sort of, all oh, right, it's wartime. But there's an element of fun to them going to London, uh, you know, it's sort of some excited tourists, but they're not just, it's kind of like, almost like going to well, you know, Disneyland, you know, it's so, so alien that it's completely thrilling. And also at that time, there was no other city like London in the world at that time. I mean, it, it was really the center. And because of the Nazi occupation of, of many countries in Europe, you had all sorts of different nationalities uh, of soldiers that had uh, Frenchmen, you, know, you had Belgians, you had uh, Poles, you had all these different nationalities coming in, in there during the war. So it, it was really an unusual place there was, uh, during that time. I mean, do you know what, what the routine was for uh, the examen on the, you know, uh, your father on the bases? I mean, how often were they uh, allowed to go and do their own thing compared to um, actually flying time? Well, they did a lot of practice flying when they got to England because really, uh, you know, they had their training in the U.S., but really they didn't have that many hours of, of training, you know, especially um of formation flying. Uh, they did a lot of formation flying, learned to t- fly tight formations to defend themselves from the Luftwaffe. And so a lot of time was spent training. Uh, a lot of times uh, the weather in England, you know, was 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 bad and they couldn't fly because it was the, the overcast or the, the, the clouds. And so they had a lot of downtime. How often they got a pass uh, you know, for the weekend or, or a leave, I'm not really sure uh, uh, about that. But they were, as you referred to, uh, Thurlai was about it's about 60 miles uh, north of London, a little bit northwest of, of London. So it wasn't that long of a train ride uh, to get into uh, into London. Any guy loved to get off the base and get into London and, and get all that that excitement. You know, if they couldn't, then 
you know, at least they could get off the base locally. Thurlai, typically they went into Bedford because uh, Thurlai was in Bedfordshire uh, and went into the pubs uh, uh, there and around that, that area. My mother recalled growing up that because uh, I'm surrounded by RAF and Canadian uh, bomber bases. My mother recalls growing up that if a, if a, a bicycle went missing, invariably it turned up one of the uh, airfields because they... Uh, one of the airmen had to get back in a hurry because uh, after a night out, <laughs> and it was just taken and thrown in a hedge back. <laughs> All those guys had bike bicycles. That was their main form of transportation. It was interesting that I forget who it was now. He used to like to just go out to the 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 uh, entrance to the base and watch guys come back at night. Because all these guys would be riding their bicycles from the local little villages drunk and they'd be falling off their bicycles and <laughs> going into ditches. <laughs> it, 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 I have to say, it, it, it all does sort of sound, that, that life when they're not flying sounds relatively, I don't know if glamorous is, is the thing, but possibly fun if the war wasn't in, it getting in the way for them. Um, so the missions, do, and how much do you know about the missions? You know, they, 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 there's a, 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 a long missions. Are they daylight bombing or are they night bombing at this point? The U.S., the 8th Air Force, they just bombed during the day. Uh, you know, they had as a, real, as a result of the Casablanca agreement with uh, Churchill and uh, Roosevelt, it was agreed that they'd have around-the-clock bombing the British would bomb at night and uh, the Americans would, would bomb during the day. So they would just bomb Germany, you know, get, they'd give them no rest. They'd just bomb continually trying to you know, bomb them into submission. But flying combat was extremely dangerous. A combat airman in the 8th Air Force during World War II was the most hazardous duty assignment in the United States military. 26,000 men died in the 8th Air Force. That's more than the entire Marine Corps fighting in the Pacific for the U.S. And another 28,000 men were became prisoners of war after their bombers were knocked out of the sky by either German aircraft, uh, anti-aircraft fire or German uh, fighter planes. It was hazardous duty. That was another thing that was unique because, you know, one moment you're in the sky facing death on these bombing missions and then... That same night or the next day, you could be in London partying. And I think that's one reason they party hard is that the next day they might be dead. Do you know how your father f found these missions? Did he find them uh, taxing? Did he, did, uh, did he pass that on to your mother? Yeah, he wrote about bombing missions in, the, in his letters to, uh, to my mother. And, you know, that when he first went up, you know, he was nervous, but then... Uh, after a while, he said that uh, he got used to him and uh, he wasn't frightened, you know, even though they're facing that, the flak and, and different things. He settled in and, you know, like I think most of those guys did, you know, they, when they got in that plane, they had a job to do and they had a crew members that were counting on each other. And so, you know, they focused and the, the fear kind of left him and they had a lot of adrenaline running through their bodies. But they focused on the job that they had to do. What surprised me is the tempo. I mean, he writes, you know, we've had two in two days. At another point, he, he says, you know, three, three months and now three in three days. All right, three in three months isn't a lot, but three in three days, if they're 10-hour missions, the turnaround time to, to fly back, you know, get yourself prepared, the, the machines get overhauled and... The tempo for those three and three days must have been terrific, the strain of them. Yeah, you know, they didn't know, they never knew when they were going to go up. I mean, they, when my dad was there, they had implemented a 25 mission limit. If you flew 25 missions, you could go back, back home. And they all, all wanted to fly missions. You know, they hated it when the weather was bad and they couldn't fly or a mission had to be aborted because of uh, mechanical failure or, or weather and they'd have to return to England. They just wanted to fly their missions and they wanted to get back home. And as you say, those those missions lasting six to 10 hours were extremely tiring. Being up in the air that long, especially for the pilots, because they had to stay alert at all times. If you were a gunner, you could kind of sleep for a while before you got over enemy, enemy territory. But those pilots, they, they it was both mentally and physically strenuous. Not only was the the, the missions lengthy, 
but they had to stay alert at all times, flying in those tight formations. They, if they you know, lost their concentration, they could clip a wing on the plane next to them or run on the plane in front of them and, and go down. They had to continually fight the turbulence, not only the weather turbulence, but all the air turbulence of all those bombers being in such close proximity to one another. The wake turbulence and the prop wash would just churn the air uh, so it'd be like a washing machine. So, and back then, you know, you really, you had really had to fly those planes. It took muscle to fly those planes. And the combat, the co-pilot flew the plane as much as the pilot. They traded off because they got so tired. And these machines, they could take some punishment. The B-17 is, is, uh, is well known for being at really be able to take a pounding. And so before we get to your father being brought down, I mean, I wonder if you could tell us about, I mean, he, had, he certainly had some close scripts, didn't he? After, uh, they've been, uh, the, the, the taken some punishment. One thing I'll state, though, that a lot of people don't realize a lot of or a lot of people think that that one crew of B-17 had a 10 man crew. They just flew all their missions together. But that was hardly ever the case because of the English weather. There were always guys getting sick, coming down with the flu, pneumonia. And so you always had to have replacements uh, for different crew positions. And then guys would get injured, you know, either from flak or uh, or a lot of guys, frostbite was a huge problem. Uh, it was minus 40 to 60 degrees below zero in those bombers at the altitude that they were flying. And my dad's, uh, one of my dad's waist gunners, John Pindrock, uh, he spent a couple months in the hospital with serious frostbite wounds. So you constantly had replacement crew members on, on the crews. They didn't fly uh, the, the same crew. Also, they didn't fly the same plane, at least in the early years of the war because they would get shot up and they'd have to go in for repair. My dad, I think he flew, flew five different B-17s uh, during his uh, combat missions there. And there would be engines that go out and that, you know, kind of limp back home and, 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 and different things. So there was always one problem or another. Well, there's one occasion when he's a co-pilot and the, the engine's hit by flak. Well, he, he was the captain on the basketball team at, at the base there and he tore the ligaments in his ankle and he couldn't fly for two months. So some of his other crews had more missions than him. But when he came back from that two-month leave, he had to fly as co-pilot uh, for a couple of times to get himself you know, back in the swing of things. And as you mentioned, he was flying the uh, co-pilot in one of those missions where they, uh, a couple of engines were knocked out. Fortunately, you know, they, no enemy fighters came and got him on that mission. But uh, it, was, it was, you know, touch and go for a while. What what hadn't directly occurred to me is that once they uh, they start to lag behind, they have to fall out of that bomber stream, and their whole defence is built around that bomber stream. So once that B seventeen's on its own, it's extremely vulnerable. Absolutely, yeah. And they must have been uh, sweating, at, uh, flying back over the uh, you know continental Europe to get to that English Channel as. You know, would have must have been a welcome sight. Oh, yeah. Now, your father's look, well, I was going to say your father's look runs out. As you said, he's already in, he gets injured with his ligament injury. So the crew carry on flying, his crew carry on flying without him. Well, they, they split up his crew and, you know, some of them would fly with one pilot. Some of them would be assigned to a different pilot. His crew just didn't stay together and they got a new pilot. They just split up, up his crew and they went and flew with a bunch of different pilots. Actually, my dad and my the full crew, my dad's full crew, his plane was named the Susan Ruth after my oldest sister, who was one year old at the time he went overseas. They only flew two missions together as a full 10 man. I hadn't realized that. So I was after after two months, he'll have come back and his official crew will have overtaken him in their uh, mission count. Well, some of them did. Some of them didn't uh, because of illness or injury. Uh, my dad's a Walter gunner. When they were coming back, they got some turbulence and he fell in the plane and hurt his back and he was in the hospital. There was always something going on. So probably half the crew had more missions than him and then half had the same or possibly less. There were some that had less missions than he did, even though he was out for two months. That's funny, isn't it? So your father's um, look does eventually, it does eventually uh, run out and they're shot down. I wonder if you could tell us about that mission. Sure. It was uh, February 8th of 1944. They were on a mission to Frankfurt. 
and they dropped their bombs uh, successfully, but uh, the Bombay doors got hit by flak and they couldn't get them back up. And as a result, that caused the drag in the plane. They lost airspeed and they started lagging behind the formation. And unfortunately, at that time, their, uh, the U.S. fighter escorts left the formation to go out, to get involved in a dogfight with some German fighters. And so they were really left exposed. And a couple uh, German Focke Wolf 190 uh, fighters singled my dad's plane out, and they came in and uh, shot down uh, the Susan Ruth. Two uh, crew members were killed in the plane. The other eight were able to bail out successfully. Um, but both those two uh, German Focke Wolf fighters were shot down. One piloted by Siegfried Merrick crashed, and he died in the plane. He's buried in uh, Belgium. And the other uh, pilot, Hans Berger, he was able to bail out and he made it through the war. During my research, <laughs> this is a pretty amazing. I still am amazed by it. Uh, one day my wife asked, why don't you try to find the German pilot that shot down your dad's plane? Like it was easy to do, no big deal. <laughs> and I thought, well, she doesn't know what she's talking about. What a dumb question. Or, you know, there's no way in the world I'm going to be able to do that. But like a good husband, I did what she told me to do. And lo and behold, I found Hans Berger and interviewed him for the book. And he gave me some wonderful insight that's in the book about what it was like to go up against the 8th Air Force. Uh, fortunately for me, Hans became a translator after the war, so he speaks perfect English. And he's still living. He's uh, turned 95 years old uh, last October. And we've become good friends and we keep in touch now and then. Well, the, it did, uh, it's pr probably unlikely, but did he actually remember you attacking your dad's, uh, the Susan Ruth? Oh, he does. He doesn't remember hardly any details. He just remembers uh, about attacking the B-17. And then he has to bail out of his plane because my dad, the gunners on my dad's plane shot up his plane. And then he bailed out and then it was he bailed out of our occupied Belgium. So the Germans picked him up and then he got back to his base. Uh, when I visited Hans in Munich, Germany, it's where Hans lived, he brought out his flight log. And turned to the, his entry in his flight log, February 8th, 1944, were recorded, you know, shooting down a B-17. and He had to bail out. You know, and I took pictures of that. You know, that I have chills. Just off. Yeah, I was going to say, that's one of those moments where the back hairs of the back of your neck goes up when a book like that's produced. How on earth did you manage to find him? You didn't just type his name into Google or something as simple as that. How do you, how do you track him down? Well, I went on Google initially uh, and just entered trying to find a Luftwaffe pilot, and a couple of forums came up, internet forums, which I joined, and I posted inquiries on those forums because I knew the day my dad was shot down, uh, the location where he was shot down, the time of day where he was shot down. And in a week, two guys got back to me, one from England and one from Belgium. And the guy from Belgium actually was a Luftwaffe, or is a Luftwaffe historian, written a number of books about uh, uh, the Luftwaffe and knew Hans Berger. And on that day, there were 12 B 17s shot down. And the one shot down south of Chimay, Belgium, was shot down by Hans Berger. And uh, so I asked him to put me in contact with, with Hans. And uh, he contacted Hans and asked me if it was okay for me to contact him, which he. He did. And then uh, for the book, actually, I interviewed him through uh, email and over the telephone. It wasn't until after I wrote the book that I went to Munich, Germany and actually met him and met him in person. So actually, it was easy, pretty easy to find him. I thought it'd be impossible because most likely, you know, most of those Luftwaffe pilots were killed during the war. And it's 70 years later, you know, he probably passed away by now. I, and I can't speak German. So how am I going to talk to him anyway? But everything just fell in place. That was just uh, amazing. Yeah, as I say, that's just amazing. You'd have thought that if, you know, because th those, those Luftwaffe pilots just flew till they died or the war ended. So Not only did they <laughs> not have mission limits, they didn't have passes. They didn't have leaves, uh, you know, leave of absence. They just went up every day. Uh, amazing. Most all his friends were killed. Absolutely. So your, your father gets out of the uh, out of the plane as it comes down. How is his... I mean, I presume they, they trained for this. How was his escape from the uh, from a from a from a B seventeen that's that's no doubt out of control? And at some point, he's had to say abandon ship. Exactly. They the it's on fire. Uh, they have to bail out, 
you know, they they tell them what to do, but none of those guys had ever jumped out of a plane before. Uh, <laughs> it's not like paratroopers where you practice jumping out of a plane. So, you know, they jump out and, you know, they're told, you know, count so many seconds, you know, and then until you until you see objects and but they don't he doesn't see anything. And so he counts and then he counts over and he gives up counting and he just, you know, he's coming down through clouds. You know, sometimes he can see the ground, sometimes he can't. But then once he sees, I think he can identify objects on the ground like buildings or, or trees. He decides to pull the chute. And he comes down successfully, except his parachute, he lands in trees and his parachute gets hung up in these trees and he's dangling 20 feet off the ground and he can't get down. But fortunately for him, a couple of young uh, Bel Belgium gentlemen, you know, saw him coming down and came to rescue him before the, the Germans got to him. Because they had patrols in the area looking for these guys that had bailed out. So they, they went back to a farmhouse, got a ladder and a rope and helped him down the tree. Uh, he was shot down around one o'clock in the uh, afternoon. They told him to stay put because it was too dangerous to try to move him during the daylight. But they'd come back that night and uh, pick him back up, which they did. And they took him to uh, the farmhouse of, of one of the uh, Belgium guys that found him. Raymond Durvan is his name, who's still alive, by the way. And uh, they took him to this farmhouse. He stayed there one night. My dad had some shrapnel wounds and some burn wounds, which uh, uh, Raymond Durvan's mother, Ida, patched up. And then that night they decided to move him because they thought it was too dangerous for him to stay there any longer than that with those German patrols in the area. So a Belgium customs officer, Paul Tilcan, came and got him on a tandem bicycle and they took off and moved him to another location. It, it, it's when he's with his tandem, isn't it, that he bumps into the Germans? Is that, am I, that's, is that the right on the timeline? Yes, yeah. They, uh, they took G out. Give us that, because that's a wonderful story. Yeah, yeah. They took out at, at night. It was pitch black. My dad said it was uh, raining. And he could only pedal with one leg because of the shrapnel wounds in his other leg. So, you know, when the pedal came around, he would push down with his good leg. And they came to a hill. And they weren't able to uh, pedal up the hill, so they got off the bike and started pushing it up the hill. And when they got to the top of the hill, there was a little uh, cafe, cabaret there. The lights were on. People were talking loudly, laughing. Music was playing. And all of a sudden, two German officers came out with their arms around young Belgium or French girls. Uh, my dad said they were, they were schnockered. And uh, one of them comes up to my dad, puts his arm around him and asks him for a light for a cigarette. My dad can't speak French. He can't er, he can't speak uh, German. So he's petrified. But uh, Paul, luckily, could converse with the guy's cigarette. And then uh, they let him on their way. My dad said that they were too drunk and too interested in these young girls to pay too much attention to a couple of jokers that were pushing a bike up in the in the in the rain up the hill. So that was a close call, and he had a number of close calls, almost being captured by the by the Germans. I mean, that's straight out of uh, some Hollywood film is that kind of uh, scene. Yeah, you can't make this stuff. <laughs> now, your father goes into hiding. How organised is sort of this resistance? I don't know if it's resistance. You know, when he's in hiding, how is it all? put together as he just sort of passed from one family to another uh, you know, as they feel well they had uh, um, the uh, there were different underground groups or, or cells and in each area had their little you know village uh, he came down in southern Belgium just north of the French border which is all farm rural farmland just little hamlets and villages scattered here and there the largest little town nearby was Chimay, and the leader of the the, the, the resistance there, uh, Albert Delpore, he was uh, the, kind of the supervisor of that district, and so they would be in communication. And basically, after they moved him from that initial farmhouse, he went. They they moved him all over the place, uh, from place to house to house. How long he stayed in any given place depended on how brave the people were who lived there, and how dangerous the underground thought it was. For him to stay there, he might spend one night at one house or might spend six weeks at another house. So he moved around a lot. Certain occasions, he almost got dis discovered. But the people in the underground who hid him 
or any downed airmen for that matter, were unbelievably brave people. They risked their lives and those of their family and, and friends uh, to aid downed airmen. If the German secret police, the Gestapo, found out, they would be arrested, tortured, neither shot, executed, or sent to concentration camps. And some of the Belgian people that helped my dad and his crew uh, did meet that fate. What surprised me is how many Belgian citizens seem willing to help. Because presumably, you know, I made a note of, you know, how the hell were they feeding these people? Because, you know, there, there's, uh, it's not just your father, there is other airmen thereabouts. So, you know, they'd be, the Belgians would be living on rations, so yet they're having to give part of whatever they have to feed these people who are not productive. You know, they're all, Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, as you said, you know, the, the, these, in these occupied uh, countries, they were on rations that were issued by the, the occupying Germans. There was a black market that you could buy stuff. But the people that had a little money, my dad said, you know, they could, you know, buy some extra provisions. But my dad did say that they would let him sleep in their bed. They would sleep on the floor. Uh, they would give him, you know, the majority of the food to eat. They're unbelievably wonderful people. Uh, they really appreciated the fact that these Americans or the British or Canadians, who, whatever, were coming, leaving their countries and, and fighting the Germans to liberate uh, these occupied company, uh, countries from, from occupation. Uh, and the majority of the people were, I think, were, were, were patriots. You did have a certain percentage of the people that were collaborators. Who either believed in fascism or they thought, well, the Germans are going to win the war, so we might as well be, you know, on their side when it's all said and done, or just people that were selfish and saw this as an opportunity to make money. And uh, it was brutal. People would you know, rat out friends who they didn't like. They might have had a little grudge, you know, that went back a few years and they'd tell, go tell the Gestapo that, oh, this person's part of the resistance and they'd be arrested. It, 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 it was terrible. Was there any chance of your father making it back to Britain? Was there any plan, if that's the right way of putting it in place for them to get, for him to get back? Yes, normally once the underground came across down airmen, they try to get him back uh, to England through various escape routes, uh, down through France, over the Pyrenees, into Spain, and then out through British control Gibraltar. Uh, but something always went wrong trying to get my, my dad out for whatever reason. You know, sometimes these escape routes, uh, they had... Uh, People would get killed who were manning the escape routes or they'd be infiltrated by uh, collaborators or uh, Germans. But, and this had to be hard on my dad because, uh, you know, just hiding and, and hiding because he was missing in action for seven months. And, uh, you know, he he's, has to bail out of his plane. He comes down in a foreign country. He has no idea where he is, uh, doesn't know what happened to the other members of his crew. Uh, can't communicate with the U.S. military. He's dealing with people who he can't communicate with because uh, at that point he can't speak French. Any one of these people might be a collaborator and turn himself, turn him into the Gestapo. And when he's hiding, the Gestapo could break in at any moment, uh, search the house and uh, capture him and arrest him and either shoot him or send him to a prisoner of war camp. Uh, and finally, he got tired of hiding. Uh, word had come that the Allies uh, had landed at Normandy. And so the invasion of occupied Europe had begun. So he decided to join the French resistance. Uh, he had that year's training in the army in Washington. So he knew how to fight on the ground. Uh, he had that uh, year's experience and he wanted to get back in the fight. So the people that were hiding him was strongly dis uh, disagreed with this, thought it was way too dangerous for him to try to do that. But he said, well, I'll just, I'm just going to take off by myself and try to meet up with the French resistance if you want, won't take me. But so one of his helpers, Amy Cools, uh, he took him on, uh, they rode bicycles uh, over the Belgian border into France. And he hooked up with this uh, French resistance called the Mackey group. And then he f fought with the, uh, the Mackey for several months before, uh, for, for several months that's, that's again it, that, that that's almost a you know a hollywood film in itself never mind the just the landing and being uh hide, hiding from uh from the germans quite remarkable what kind do you know what kind of operations they were uh undertaking 
Yeah, the uh, well, the Mackie, the French Resistance, they were made up of small independent guerrilla groups that were scattered all over France. Uh, there were about 20 in my dad's group. They were led by a French lieutenant who had escaped from a German prisoner of war camp. And when he first met up with them, they they didn't accept him right away. It's, you know, he he could speak conversational French by then. But, you know, here's this America. They don't know he is who he is because the makeup of the group were either Belgians, uh, Frenchmen, or they had some uh, Algerians uh, as, as well. And now this, so my dad is this foreigner, so it had to take. It took a little while for them to to, to accept him, but he probably proved himself that he knew how to, to fight on the ground. The, the resistance groups they'd get their instructions uh, from the British over the BBC through coded me- messages that they were also supplied uh, by the British through airdrops. And the job of the resistance was to harass the Germans. They would disrupt uh, communications, sabotage railroad lines, uh, attack German convoys, uh, assassinate German officers. And my dad did say that the information that the British gave him over these coded messages was unbelievably accurate. Uh, If the British said there'd be a German convoy, you know, on this date, at this time, at this place, sure enough, they'd be... The the American army... It's the Americans who, who push up into his sector. I mean, do you know at what point, you know, how do you present yourself to the American? You know, do you just walk over the lines and say, hi, I'm a downed airman? Or, and they say, oh, hi, welcome back. Or, 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 you know, it strikes me as being rather a risky point, that point where he has to return to the, uh, the American full because they could, you know, it could be a collaborator, it could be all kinds of things. Do you know how that happened for your father? Yeah, uh, one day on September 2nd of 1944, uh, he and his Mackey group, they had set up an ambush for a German convoy that didn't, that one didn't show up that day. Because at that time, the Germans were just fleeing eastward uh, in advance of the the Allied uh, push up through France. Uh, But word uh, filtered through that there were U.S. troops in a nearby village of Trelon, France. So my dad walked into the town square, walked up to uh, an army major. Actually, it was an element of Patton's Third Army that had come up through France uh, after D-Day. And, uh, you know, identified himself and he was interrogated because, as as you said, it could be some infiltrator. And then once they were uh, satisfied that he was who he said he was, uh, he hooked a ride with a convoy that was taking prisoners, German prisoners to Paris and then got on a C-47, went back to uh, to England. So seven months after, from the time his plane was shot down uh, till he was missing in action. Actually, my other sister was born while he was missing in action. That before he finally got back to uh, to England, and my my mother got word to my mother that he was alive. Yeah, how much were the families of the aircrew aware of what had happened from that moment they didn't return from the mission? Or was it, was it complete blackout? Well, they were shot down on February 8th, uh, 44. And my mother got a telegram from the War Department on February 23rd that the plane had gone down and the crew was missing in action. Uh, there were some members of the crew that were, who bailed out, who were captured by the Germans and became prisoners of war. They were able to write home. The various family members, you know, uh, they were three of the crew who were married at the time. Um, the others weren't, but mothers or girlfriends and their wives, uh, they would all be writing back and forth. Uh, and so word came that these three guys had uh, been captured and were alive. They did say, though, that two of the crew had been killed. Um, but it was assumed that the other men who had bailed out, hopefully were prisoners of war, and hopefully at some point in time, they'd uh, be heard from. Actually, of the remaining crewmen, uh, the ones that weren't killed or became POWs, my dad was the first one to make it back to England. So that gave him a lot of hope. They're going, oh, Howard's back. Um, he made it. So, you know, maybe the others are going to be shortly following him. But unfortunately, you know, that wasn't the case uh, completely. Five of the crew made it back home, but five of them, did not. It's interesting. He wrote to uh, Ruth saying how um, 
lucky he was to be in the Air Force, not in the infantry stuck in a foxhole. I wonder if in later life he still believed that, that he'd been lucky to be in the Air Force. Even though, as I mentioned, you know, being a combat crewman was the most deadly, ass- deadly assignment, I don't think those guys really realized it who were flying combat. Um, they were glad that, you know, they could come back to a warm bed and, uh, you know, good food and have a chance to party, party a little bit. And they, they just looked at it as, you know, they had a job to do and they were over there to do it. If you talk to any of these veterans, you know, they are so humble. I just talked to a 97 year old veteran last night. He called me. He lives in Florida. He read my book and he called me up to talk about it. And all these guys are the same way. They they just had a job to do. They're not heroes. You know, they just went over there, did their job, and then came back and got on with their lives. You know, we look at it, you know, to me, they were the greatest generation, with, without a doubt. But I, my dad was glad that he was in the, in the Air Force. You know, most of those guys, even though they were getting killed at such a rapid rate, early, especially early in the war, you know, they're, when you're – you know, a teenager, early 20s, you think you're invincible and you're going to live forever and that, you know, the other guy's going to get killed, but you know, it won't be me. And most of those guys had that attitude. Well, Steve, thanks for sharing your father's story. Listeners, if you want to read the full story and find out what happened to the rest of the crew of the Susan Ruth, the book is Shot Down by Steve Snyder. I will, of course, put a link on the website. But before I go, I have one more thing to share with you. I had an email recently from Phil Cristofaro. Phil has recently mentored four girls aged 9 to 11 in producing an interactive book telling the stories of four children growing up in Europe and their lives during World War II. It's called Convergence. It's absolutely superb. I'll put a link on the website, www.podcast.com. If you have a Mac or an iPad, Go and have a look in the Apple uh, iBook store thing. It's free, so you have no excuse. I have no idea where we'll be for the next podcast, most probably either in Italy or on the Eastern Front. But until then, I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening.